Good morning. I'd like to begin, um, <coughs> excuse me, allergies. <laughs> I'd like to begin with a reading from the book of Ephesians. This is from the second chapter of Ephesians, uh, starting verse 19. Paul, speaking to the church in Ephesus, said, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Will you please stand and let's lift our voices together. You are the stone that the builders rejected, a rock of refuge where my pride is broken. A sure foundation when the sand is sinking Where we are built upon like living stones There is no one else like you There is no one like you, Lord There is no one else like you Son of man and son of God Son of man and son of God When from the cross to the depths he sinned, the hosts of hell conspired to make you captive. But every chain of sin and death you've broken and triumphed over by your mighty power. There is no one else like you. There is no one like you, Lord. There is no one else like you. Son of man and son of From the earth to the heights ascended, where you are seated at your Father's right hand, forever pleading for the souls you captured, forever purging as you call us home. There is no one else like you. There is no one like you, Lord. There is no one else like you, Son of Man. Son of God, Son of Man and Son of God, Son of Man and Son of God. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to Marsh Ford Fellowship. Whether you're here in the building or at home, we welcome you. If there's anything that we can do for you, even if you don't belong to this church, we would appreciate you just letting us know so that we can help you in any way that we can. Some quick announcements, just some birthdays. Uh, Kim Edlin's having a birthday on July 4th. Uh, I don't know how you arranged that to have that same day as July 4th and the national holiday, but so uh, when you get a chance, tell Kim happy birthday. Also, Bill and Jan Just, their uh, anniversary is Thursday the 2nd. So if you get a chance just to send them an email or whatever, just to wish them a uh, happy anniversary. Uh, that's about all the announcements I have. Um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we gather here today, and again, we, these are unique times, and we're doing things, and we're adjusting, and we're adapting, and uh, we thank you. We thank you in the middle of all of this that you are who you are, and you've allowed us to be a part of your family. You've called us to be your kids, and we thank you for that. And so in the middle of these trying times, we lean on you even harder. Uh, we understand that you're still in charge, that uh, with your grace and mercy, we will uh, be able to persevere. And so, Lord, we just uh, thank you as we gather here to celebrate you through uh, our singing, our fellowship, and our study of your word, that uh, you are who you are, and we, we're so grateful that you've uh, invited us into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you uh, stand once more? Let's sing again. We are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. The Spirit has brought us together as one. Though we may be separate, we're one perfect whole. We are his body and he is our We are the blessed receivers of his inexhaustible love. So it is out of believers the body of Christ is made of. We are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. The Spirit has brought us together as one. That we may be separate, we're one perfect whole. We are his body and is our soul forever we'll have one another because we belong to the Lord so we belong to each other and that is our greatest reward we are flesh of his flesh bone of his bone the spirit has brought us together as one that we may be Separate, we're one perfect whole. We are his body and he is our soul. We are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. The Spirit has brought us together as one. Though we may be separate, we're one perfect whole. We are his body and he is our soul. We are his body and he is our The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he and for her life he died. He elects from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one one holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food, and to one hope she presses with every grace in due. May 
Amid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victory. Yes, shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. Oh, happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee.
have a seat. Good morning. It's great to have you all this morning. Great to see faces and not be preaching to pews. <laughs> uh, for those that are here, great to worship with you. For those that are at home, we are so glad you came to worship with us. For those that were with us last week, I apologize for sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher. We had some, um, some audio issues, and so we reshot um, the sermon. If you haven't watched it and would like to, it is, it is on Facebook and YouTube. But we're going to get back into 1 Corinthians. This morning we're going to be in chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to continue our, our study on spiritual gifts. I want to start out talking about family. Family is the cornerstone or is one of the cornerstones of this church. We love Jesus. We love to worship Him. We, we love missions and we're a family. So what does it mean? What does it mean to say that we are a, a family church? It just sounds like a cliche thing to say, but what does it actually mean? It means we belong to one another. In a family, you don't just look out for yourself, but you take care of your family above you. See, when Jesus died on the cross for our salvation, 
He didn't just do it to rescue us of our sin and to save us from hell, but, but he saved us into the family of God. We're not only forgiven, it says that we're adopted into the family of God. So what that means is I belong to you and you belong to me, whether you like it or not. You may not want me, but you're stuck with me. You're no longer living in isolation. We're no longer scattered around, but we are a family. First thing we did as deacons and elders when the coronavirus hit is, is we split up between the deacons and the elders, the church family, and, and uh, encourage them to weekly call to make sure everybody's needs are taken care of because that's what family does. We take care of one another. We wanted to make sure you were okay and encourage you to help out where you can help out. We're called to fellowship. We're called to family. You are called to live in the family of God. Your individuality is amazingly important, but only when it's being used in the family of God. You don't have to turn there, but Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 says, You are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. When you, when you read that, when you think that, you think, Ah, oh, I'm the light of the world. I am a city. It's not what it's saying. It's talking to the church, saying you. The church, you, you are the light of the world. You are that city on the hill. Things are no longer just about you, but about family. We are together in ways that we cannot describe. That's the family of God. We're dysfunctional, absolutely. But we love one another and we care for one another. The way in that you love and care for one another doesn't make sense to the world. When somebody puts, their need, puts their, uh, somebody else's needs over their own, when somebody cares for somebody more than they care for themselves, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to the world. That's why we're a family church. We know one another. We love one another. We hold each other accountable and we drive one another crazy because that's part of being in a family. With that being said, I think we have to understand that as we get into the context of 1 Corinthians 14. See, this chapter isn't about prophecy. It's, it's not about speaking in tongues, but it's about the family of God working together with the gifts and the talents that God has given us. So we have to have Philippians chapter 2 in mind. I'll read from there, and I think it'll be on your screens for you. Philippians 2 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. And then he says, do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you the interests of the others. In your relationships, one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. That's what a family is. That's what we're called to be. He's talking to the church. He says, encourage one another. Be united with Christ. Be compassionate. Be like-minded, having the same love. Is that easy? No. None of that's easy. So how do we do it? Luckily, Jesus, when he came back, he narrowed everything down to two things. Love the Lord your God above everything else. And love your neighbor as yourself. How much did having a family, for those that have a family, change your life? When you got married, did you make changes? Did things change once you got married? You could not be nearly as selfish as you were before. How about when you had kids? How big of a life changer was that? What changed when you had kids? Everything. Absolutely everything. You spend money differently. You get a different car. Possibly get a different job. There's people that have given up their careers because it, it wasn't sustaining. It wasn't, it wasn't good for raising a family. People change their complete lives 
to protect and provide for their family. I have friends that are musicians, and as soon as they got kids, the gig was up. <laughs> Had to find something with insurance and, and benefits and something that was more consistent in, in paying. You give up everything to provide. Everything to give the best for those that you love and for those that are in your family. So what about church family? As a church family, we have to put God first. And you have to put others' interests above yourselves, above your own. And when we do those two things as a church, we win. When we do those two things as a church, we win and He wins. Paul said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking for your own interests, but, but for the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset of Jesus. That is what church looks like. That's what a church family looks like, and that's why it's so important to us. But does anybody struggle with this? Does anybody struggle with pride and selfishness? I'm going to make this a little more tangible or try to. You're adopted into the family, and you're called to treat others better than you treat yourself. He left heaven. Jesus literally left heaven to come into our poverty. He was seated next to God, had everything, was in perfect relationship for eternity with God, left everything to come into our poverty, our sin, and our sickness so that He could give us everything that He could. To come and wash our feet. The King of kings and Lord of lords came to serve. And this is how we are to treat one another. See, there's a lot of things going on in the church of Corinth. A lot of very talented people. Powerful church, but Paul sees a, a lot of the gifts that are happening. And it seems like no one is unified. They sit by each other, but they don't care about one another. They can't stand one another. And Paul's going to mention two of these gifts. And I, I again, don't want us to get caught up in the gifts because I don't think the point of this is the, the actual two gifts. He talks about the gift of prophecy and the gift of speaking in tongues. And he spends the majority of the time talking about prophecy. And again, this sermon is not going to be about either. I encourage you in your small groups, if you want to break down these two gifts, to, to break down prophecy and speaking in tongues. But I don't think it's the point. But I'll give you a brief explanation of what they are. Explanation of tongues is a language between you and God that most don't understand. And it's done in worship. It's not a bad thing. In the New Testament church, speaking in tongues wasn't a bad thing, but, but people were, were not sharing what they were hearing from God. They weren't sharing what they were saying. There was not a translation. So for those that were in the church and, and saw somebody speaking in tongues, it was just all a big show. Seems if most, if not all the time this happened in Corinth, the, the person involved shared nothing with the church of, of the experience that they had with, with God there. People that had this gift projected themselves as better, more gifted, because look at how intimate I worship God. It reminds me of that stupid fraternity handshake that people have. You know, like, let me shake your hand the way that only we know what's going on. Sorry if you're in a fraternity, I apologize. But not really. This gift of tongues was seen as elite in the church. Over gifts like hospitality and, and education and, and serving and even prophecy. And it seems like there was a division in the church. So with that as a long backdrop, let's get into 1 Corinthians 14. If you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 14, we'll start with verse 1. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow the way of love. What a great way to start this out. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Before Paul bashes the church for the way they're using their spiritual gifts, he first says, follow love and eagerly, eagerly desire the gifts. Don't let what Paul's about to say make you think that gifts are a bad thing, that spiritual gifts are a bad thing. They're amazing. But we were never called to use them selfishly. They were never called to, to be on, on showcase. They were called to edify one another. So prophecy, what is prophecy? Telling the future, right? God told me this was going to happen. 
I told everybody, I warned them, and then it happened. Kind of. Prophecy is much deeper than that. Here's how I'm going to define it. When God speaks a truth into your life, whatever that truth is, but when He speaks a truth into your life, and you go and you share that. This can be done in church on the stage. This can be done in your Sunday school rooms. This can be done in your small groups. It can be done in your grocery store, at your workplace, on the golf course. It can be done at school. If speaking a truth God communicated to you, Paul is saying, you might want the gift of tongues, and that's a great gift. But if you really want to make an impact, seek the gifts that edify one another, not just you. Some are probably listening this morning thinking, neither one of these two are my gifts, so I'm just going to zone out. Stay tuned. Stay tuned in. If you don't have the gift of encouragement, this doesn't mean permission to be a jerk to one another. If you, if you don't have the gift of evangelism, it doesn't mean that you don't have to tell people about Jesus and what He's doing in your life. If your gift is not prophecy... You have to still know that we're called into a family, into a community where we speak truths into each other's lives. Paul said, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. Paul's saying you need to share. What God, is, what God is doing with you and in you and through you, don't keep that to yourself. Don't hesitate. Share your struggles, share your successes, and share how God is working in and through you. Verse 2, for anyone who speaks in tongues and does not speak to people but to God, which is a great thing. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit in verse 3. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Paul is saying, don't shy away from the gifts. But if you want to elevate a gift... If you want to pursue a gift, make sure it's one that edifies the family of God. And in verse 4, anyone who speaks in tongues edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you have a prophecy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. The problem isn't. The gift, the problem was the motivation behind the gift. And remember, the motivation behind everything we do is what? Love. If that's not the motivation, then then you're missing the boat. If the motivation is, look at me, look how close me and God are. Check this out. I'm going to show this to you. You need to be more like me. We have this. You're missing the boat. You're missing the point. Skip to verse 9. Paul says, so it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue... How will anybody know what you're saying? You'll just be speaking into the air. And undoubtedly there are all sorts of language in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker. And the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you, since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. That's what family does. You build one another up. Sometimes you knock each other down. That's part of family too. That's not what we're talking about here. The family builds one another up. They have each other's back all the time. Out of love. And the church in Corinth was not doing that. The church in Corinth, it seemed like the gifts were more about the the ones that were gifted. More so than building each other up. The gifts was more about the gift gift. It was more about the, the gifter than it was the gift giver. Paul is letting them know that they are failing. They are looking selfish. They're looking foolish. They're looking similar to the world. That teaches you have to be selfish to get ahead. That teaches if you want something done right, what do you have to do? Do it yourself. A world that teaches you you got to lie, cheat, and steal to get ahead. And Paul is saying that's not what Christ looks like. It's not what his church looks like. And you got to love Paul. He's talking about being... Um, not prideful, and, and then look at, his, look at what he puts in in verse 18. He puts them right in their place. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. <laughs> but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others 
than 10,000 words in tongues. What does this look like for us? What does that word edify mean? In the Greek, it was a, a construction term. It was an architectural term that meant to build up or to create. So what does this mean? How do we build one another up? First thing we have to do is change our mindset. Have you ever tried to change your mindset? It's nearly impossible. It's impossible to, to say, you know what, I'm just going to change the way that I think about life now. Start putting others ahead of myself. How do, you, how do you make that change in your mind? You hit your knees and you say, God, create in me a new heart. Create in me a new mind. Help me learn how to love others the way that you have loved me. Help me put others above myself. You will not change without the power of the Holy Spirit. To learn to put others first. To build them up. And for me, the easiest way to edify the church is one of the most difficult things for us to do. Is the confession of sin. It's your favorite thing to do, right? But when you confess your sin to one another, what happens? It allows everybody to open up. I've been in church since I was a little kid. And I've been to many churches, and it took decades for me to hear somebody confess their sin to somebody else in a, in a small group setting. The first time I remember it was, was out of college. I was in a small group of just guys, and it was just your typical man Bible study. We'd show up about 15 minutes late. We'd talk about sports. We'd talk about each other. We had opened the book that we were all going through, and did you read this way? Ah, I forgot. Did you read this way? Ah, I forgot. Well, let's just skip the book part, and let's pray for one another and call it a day. That's what we did. And after we prayed for one another, one of the guys said, guys, I got, I got something I got to share with you. And this was a very well-respected guy in our group. He said, I, I've had a pornography problem for a long time. And he just opened up. He said, I've been, I've been battling this for a really long time. And he said, I want you guys to pray for me and hold me accountable. And we all said, we'll do that. And we were about to leave, and another guy says, hey, I've really been struggling with this issue. And he digs into what he's been struggling with. He said, can you guys hold me accountable with that? We said, absolutely. And we're about to leave. And another guy said, guys, I've got to get this off my heart. And he shared. And it was amazing. That group was so tight-knitted. We didn't tell anybody's stories. We kept it to ourselves. But we knew that we had each other's backs. We prayed for one another. We shared with one another. And that group completely was edified and uplifted because of one person sharing the struggles that they were going through. It allows you to know that people are praying for you. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he wrote a book called Life Together. I highly recommend it, but there's a quote. He says, the more a person is isolated, the more destructive the power of sin over them is. Sin wants to remain unknown. Sin wants to make you shameful and makes you want to bury it under the carpet so nobody else knows you're dealing with it. Well, what's the point of sin? It's to push us closer to Jesus. That is what sin is for. It's to say, I can't do this on my own. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I've failed a million times. But by the grace of God, I can come to you and you take care of that for me. And you start to change me from within. I believe when sin is exposed, when it is confessed, it loses its power. And it belongs to a sense of community. In that guy's group that I still talk with today, we still have that bond that we shared our struggles with one another and had each other's backs. That's family. What does the Bible say the root of all sin is? Pride. Our pride. I run my own life. I follow my own laws and my own rules. My hatred, my desires are under my control. That's what pride says. And the reason, honestly, we don't confess sins to one another, the bottom line is we care more about ourselves than we do others. 
If we care more about ourselves than we do others, uh, that's where pride comes in. We care more about our image than we do redemption and healing. Because confession of sin isn't only healing to you, it's healing to the family. I want to edify the church. I encourage you to let your guard down. Share your struggles with one another. Share your successes with one another. I told you this sermon wasn't about prophecy or speaking in tongues. It's about edifying the church. It's about edifying the family of God. That's Paul's point here. His point isn't to get into this theology about speaking in tongues. It's about taking care of the family. It's about edifying the family. I've probably never been more involved in a Bible study that does that than in our marriage group. The very first time we met, everybody was like an open door. <laughs> the very first time the marriage group got together, we, we started up this where we were going to share a, a, a testimony. One person would share their story. We, we called it testimony, but their story. Their ups and their downs in life, their, their family, their, their marriage, their, their kids, the struggle of everything and, and the successes that they've had and their relationship with God. And from week one, I think every single person in the room was in tears. It takes a lot of putting others first to reveal yourself. So what are practical ways we can edify and, and uplift the church, that we can edify the family of God? So one, be vulnerable. Two, encourage. Encourage one another. And three, use your gift. Paul is saying we have these gifts. Use them. Use them not for yourself, but use them to edify and uplift the church. Don't be shy. Don't wait for the perfect time. Find out what, what you are good at. Find out where, where God blesses you and get in the fight. The church can't operate without you using your gift. One of the most amazing things that you can do to uplift the family, the body of Christ, is encouragement. I remember, um, you guys ever have, have a bad work day, a bad day, a bad week, just like nothing goes right, coworkers are driving you nuts, you, you feel like you can't succeed at, at anything. You ever, you ever been there? I was having a particular week like that. Um, it was on a Monday, and Mondays are like the worst days for pastors because you're like, man, that sermon was terrible. And, and it, was one, it was one of those where I just felt bad about myself. Um, and out of the blue, Danny came up uninvited the way that he always did. And he, uh, he had no idea I was having a bad day. And he came up to me and said, I just want to encourage you. You're doing a good job. He said, God is blessing you. God is using you. He spoke to me through your last sermon. He gave me a hug. Big, burly biker dude. And then he left. That was exactly what I needed. It's what we're talking about. Uplifting the family of God. We have some great encouragers in this church that love to do that. And thank God for you. Follow after those gifts that edify the church. Follow after those gifts that glorify God, that glorify the church over yourself. You have no clue the impact that that'll have. I want to end with this. The reason that we put so much time and encouragement in in trying to be a family church is because family more than anything that we have on earth reflects the love of God. There's nothing more important that we can do as believers than to reflect God's love. Most people, when they think about love, clearly not everybody, but most people, when they think about love, they think about a family member and the way that they are loved through them. Whether it's the love of a mother or father or of a sibling, and that's why family is important to us. When we take care of one another, when we love one another with the love that Christ has put in us, we are that light on a hill. We are the city on the hill. We are the light in the dark place that this world desperately needs.
So we're not getting into the, the gift of tongues today. We're not getting into the gift of prophecy. We will uh, talk about the gifts in the next two weeks. But to, before we start there, I think Paul's encouragement to us is it's not about you. It's about him and his family. And what's your role in that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we think as we sang this morning that we are fully loved by you. God, in a way that we can't even come close to comprehending. Not only what you did on the cross, but Lord, but what you continue to do in and through our lives. Intimately involved in every detail of our life. Lord, we're overwhelmed by that and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for those that don't know you. Lord, I pray that you you speak to them, whether it's through us or through the family of God or, or through your creation, God. Speak to them and let them see the importance of family. The importance of love in a family, of, of protecting one another and, and having each other's backs. Lord, I pray that we Go out of this place today. Go out of our homes today. Go out of wherever we're leaving today, Lord, and reflect that love in you. And we'll give you the glory for it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's let's close today by singing together again, Flesh of His Flesh, the first verse and chorus. We are the blessed receivers of His inexhaustible love. And so it is out of believers the body of Christ is made of. We are the blessed receivers of His inexhaustible love. So it is out of believers the body of Christ is made of. We are flesh of His flesh, bone of His bone. The Spirit has brought us together as one. Though we may be separate, we're one perfect whole. We are His body and He is ours. We are his body. We are his body and he is our soul. Go in peace.